All right. Welcome, everybody, to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Today, we have the co-creators of Decolonized Palestine. Um, I'm just going to pull up the, their, um, their introductions really quick. Um, sorry, I should have had that ready. Um, so just a couple of words before we get started. So, you know, our goal here is to bring conversations that can help us orient ourselves uh, in this current struggle, um, in this current um, massive geopolitical situation, which is uh, most urgently, you know, situated in, in Palestine. It, it most urgently affects Palestinian people. Um, and it is a product of uh, a recent phase of the Palestinian uh, liberation struggle, which is a long struggle. Um, our guests from Decolonized Palestine do, you know, an amazing job of, um, you know, laying out, there goes my earpiece, uh, Sorry, guys, the technical difficulties. Um, apologies, my earpieces are acting up. So anyways, let me let me introduce our guests so that we can get into this. Um, so Rowan Masri is a museum cur curator and researcher currently living in Ramallah where with her husband, Fathi, she helped write the collection of resources for organizers and those wishing to learn more about Palestine that is decolonizedpalestine.com. You can follow her at River2C48 on Twitter. Fathi Namir, the Palestine Policy Fellow at Al Shabaka. He previously worked as a research associate with the Arab World for Research and Development, a teaching fellow at Berzit University and program officer with the Ramallah Center for Human Rights, for Human Rights Studies. Fathi is the co-founder of Palestine, decolonizedpalestine.com along with his wife, Rowan. Fathi's research revolves around political economy and contentious politics. You can follow him at a man in the sun on Twitter. All of that is in the show notes. I'm not gonna take up more of our time because I'm already fumbling around a bit. So Rowan and Fathi, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Thank you for having us, Jared. I do want to just quickly add that I'm a translator. I'm not a curator. Not yet. So not oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> my bad. Um, <laughs> I will. I will edit that, in, or maybe I just misspoke. Um, so, anyways, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do. I do want to say, you know, what I meant to say before, which is just that the work that you do at decolonizedpalestine.com is essential for folks. I think that anyone who is interested in learning more about um, this struggle needs to go there, needs to read the, the work that you have laid out, the Palestine 101 section to really understand the history and go through the myth section, which is incredible in terms of debunking the myths, which I know we're gonna talk about a few of those later on as we get into this conversation. Um, to start, you know, the original reason that I first reached out is Rwan, you just published a piece and I really wanted to just give folks one, the link to that is also in um, the, the show notes. But I just wanted to ask you sort of to lay out for our audience here, what were the interventions you wanted to make with your piece? What framings did you want to push, push back against? And how should we all orient ourselves in thinking about what Al-Aqsa flood means for the Palestinian people? Um, and Fathi, of course, we want your thoughts as well, but we'll start with Rowan since she's the author of this piece. Thank you so much, Jared. So in writing the piece, what really kind of inspired me was wanting to add to the discourse in English, however way I could, of the hope Palestinians felt seeing that fence literally go down. Um, we, because as Palestinians, we know very viscerally how all encompassing and awful the blockade has been. We know even going further before the blockade, the reason the vast majority of Palestinians in Gaza are even there stuck in the first place is because they were made refugees in 1948 through a series of quite horrible massacres, 
of the you know a kind of psychological campaign of fear that accompanied those massacres and rather than being allowed to return to their homes rather than even having this kind of wide-scale acknowledgement of what they were put through instead over and over again they have been bombed and airstriked and we know even that the israeli army quite literally calculates how many calories they want to enter into gaza uh, as was put by uh, an Israeli government member, I believe, the Minister of Defense, I'm not sure, but he said that we want to put them on a diet. So I kind of wanted to push that. I wanted to situate uh, Palestine and Palestinian resistance in the, the kind of you know long history of other oppressed groups who have been, who fought for their liberation, who were also not very popular at the time, only in hindsight were, you know, in Algeria or Vietnam, was it understood that yes, they were uh, battling something ruthless and innately violent, and uh, they did everything they could by any means necessary to, to break out of that. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to kind of, um, I want like situate side by side, if you will, how the condition of the average Palestinian, especially in Gaza, and the condition of the average Israeli. I wanted to uh, kind of emphasize that to be the status quo that uh, Israelis want to maintain necessarily requires the oppression of Palestinians. It necessarily requires the death of Palestinians. And I'm, I'm sorry, there was something else I was going to say. <laughs> And very much kind of like emphasizing how violence of the oppressor it, it cannot be equated with so, like quote unquote violence of the oppressed. And even this kind of like inherent to the piece is this idea of, you know, Palestinians have done all these other nonviolent forms of resistance that have been quashed and called every single kind of terrorism, diplomatic terrorism, economic terrorism, I, like writing is terrorism. Uh, like, as I said, at the, the end of the piece, you know, uh, Palestinians have been imprisoned for social media posts and poetry. Um, we are supposed to kind of accept that our children can be kidnapped in the middle of the night uh, as a precautionary measure. Um, boycotts, again, were are illegal in many U.S. states. So... I think that that was kind of what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of push back against that because it feels like there's just this flood of uh, separate the Palestinians from Hamas and condemn this and condemn that. And how could you do this? And it's not getting to the root cause of why we're even here in the first place. Yeah, and I think something very important that your article touches on is that it tries to situate the current escalation in its historical context. Like this did not bubble out of nowhere. This is not just because Palestinians were bored one day and they were like, hey, let's just start, you know, doing whatever. Uh, this is a continuum. This You can trace it back very clearly to the Nakba, as basically you said, that most of Gaza are refugees. Most of Gaza are refugees from the areas where they can see, but they can never go back to, and they're banned from going there simply because they would be an inconvenient demographic threat, quote unquote, which is what we're called very often because they're not Jewish, very simply for that. So I think it's very important that whenever people think of Gaza or think of what is going on right now, like you cannot look at it as if it's a bubble or a vacuum. You have to look at it in its current, its, its correct historical context. You have to see it in connection with the previous wars in Gaza where every war they call it mowing the lawn. Like that's how dehumanized Palestinians are for like the Israeli media and the state and everybody accepts that. So like we need to be able to trace everything back historically and be able to situate why are these people trying to break out of whatever hell that they were in and not that this was just some kind of separate escalation that was you know triggered by bloodlust, irrational hatred or whatever that is being uh, currently uh, you know talked about especially in western media. Yes, thank you for that. And I think you know just this idea of what Palestinian resistance is fighting for versus what like the Israeli army is fighting for. The Israeli army is fighting for the preservation of an ethno supremacist project that dehumanizes and denies rights to everyone who is not Jewish. That's what they're defending. We're defending refugees uh, having their suffering acknowledged and you know made up for even in as 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 much as we can. And I think also because something else I'm reminded of uh, something I wrote about who you 
identify with more or who you want to defend more? Do you see yourself or do you want to see yourself as in solidarity with a Palestinian who has lived through multiple bombing campaigns, multiple wars, who has lived through having their electricity and their water uh, and medical aid controlled? Or do you see yourself more in being the kind of person who is partying close to a concentration camp? Like, is that what you would have been doing in Nazi Germany? Like, are you, would you have been having this so, sort of peace? That's why I described it as like a parallel reality. It's just so far from what children in Gaza have had to experience. It's so far from, I think something that breaks my heart that I think about over and over again is how many Palestinians in Gaza have thought about suicide, who don't, who feel that uh, the world doesn't actually see them as humans because a lot of the world does not, especially those in power. And what it means to see yourself as like, no, that's what needs to change here. Yeah. Yeah, there was a a social media post the other day that was just, you know, wrecking, right? It was just, it was this woman who was sort of, um, you know, just just sharing that she has had thoughts of taking the lives of her own children, a woman in Gaza, Amen, um, yeah. just, just so that they wouldn't have to, um, you know, be you know the terror that is being enacted upon them uh that, that that they could have some relief from that and obviously that's a it's a horrible uh thought to have to have as a parent um i have two kids you know and yet i i as a parent i could also on some level relate to what that must be like in that moment you know because it's just i mean the images that we're getting out of gaza are just um you know, and there's words can't describe them, you know. Um, I do want to draw attention to a couple points that you make, um, which you've, you've mentioned them. But in the article, I just want to quote a, a, a part, which, um, you know, much of the commentary around the all Aqsa flood operation where Palestinian resistance fighters from Gaza broke free from concentration camp, we know as the Gaza Strip dismisses or outright ignores two things that every Palestinian knows to be true. One, there is no form of violence that Israel can hope to punish us with for the first time now. Massacres, home demolitions, life imprisonment sentences where prisoners are tortured and sexually assaulted, blockade and siege, uh, execution in the streets. Over and over again, we watch funeral after funeral, and we know that that in horror we will see many more that was point one point two was uh we do not intend to remain a population of oppressed refugees and prisoners and denied access to the land that is our way of life forever so i didn't you know if there's anything that you wanted to also add from those two points i know that you've already touched on both of them but um i thought that that was very well just succinctly laid out in terms of two of kind of essential things that need to be understood about this moment yeah, I want to add um, just for a few examples of when I talk about uh, violence and uh, sexual assault uh, against Palestinians. We kind of touched upon that both in our pink washing and our purple washing articles. Uh, pink washing, obviously, about this idea that as we're we're seeing pretty calm, I think repeated a lot on social media now, right? Like, oh, you queers for Palestine, if you were in if you were in Gaza right now, this is what Hamas would do to you. Um, this is, or you know, this idea of like the feminist idea of soldiers, or kind of like these unsubstantiated uh, atrocity propaganda points, really about uh, Hamas uh, did this to women and did this to babies. I want to say that it's even it, it feels you know they even our pain and our stories they try to repurpose it for their for their own ends. So I want to say that we touched upon it a, a bit more detail there if people want to understand more. Um, and it's that we we knew that the retaliation against like there wasn't a single Palestinian on Saturday who didn't know that we were about to see something really terrible happen to to Gaza in response. But it's also that again, this wasn't the first time that a Palestinian like a Palestinian has of a certain age that's all like that's all they've known is every few years uh, they're you're going to see bodies everywhere. You're going to see buildings destroyed sometimes on top of your head. Um, and just knowing that this is this is why the stakes are so high. Like, this is why the resistance is so needed because it's quite literally life or death on an enormous scale. Um, and the, the second point is that we can't 
wait for, I think, other people to be more on board. We can't wait for uh, what for Biden to grow a conscience, I guess, or for these kind of people in positions of power to to uh, give us the green light. Is this that we know that is life or death? We know that we can't have these like for as far as I'm concerned, everyone in Gaza is a hostage of of Israel. The fact that whenever Israel wants, it can rain this hellfire down on them. Like that's what needs to, like this kind of power dynamic that is that we see the bloody results of over and over again. Like that's what we we need to to end. Unfortunately, and again, because I situated it with Algeria and Vietnam, like that was bloody too. The the their wars uh, were were awful too. A lot of people suffered, but it's because Israel is willing to enact this violence or enact this suffering just to maintain the supremacist project that we have to do this. Yeah, and there's no indication that there's there's any kind of end in sight. Like people want us to be Gandhi. We tried Gandhi and we were shot. Like in 2018, 2019, we have a whole generation of youth that are maimed now who can never walk again because we did try Gandhi because the whole world was telling us try Gandhi. We have in the past, we've tried a lot of things. And not only is the international community and the so-called, you know, rules-based international order and that nonsense, not only are they just trying to, you know, maintain the conflict because at the end of the day, their interests are with Israel, not with us. They're trying to bypass the Palestinians completely. They're trying to go to normalization with Saudi Arabia. They're normalizing with the Abraham Accord. They just one Arab with another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same difference. They want to cut us out completely from everything. And we are taken out of the equation. And there's, there's like, it was the one precondition that the Palestinians used to play in the past was that after the Palestinian sovereign state, Israel could be integrated in the region, there could be normalization with everybody. Now they're just doing that without Palestinians finding any kind of uh, resolution. So it's, there was, what is, what is the, what's the alternative to just wait quietly, like Rowan said, to just wait until Biden grows a conscience? That's never going to happen until, uh, like, how long must Palestinians suffer? Like, we can't, you can't, there's no such thing as a perfect victim. There's no such thing as noble suffering that if you suffer enough, the world will be like, you know what, these people deserve to be free. That does not exist. That has never existed. That will never exist. And also perfect resistance will never exist. No matter what you do, you're going to be condemned. Even uh, boycotts are condemned. Uh, trying to access the International Criminal Court, which should be like the core of the most agreeable, the most like milk toast, ineffective way to reach a topic in the international community, which is supposed to be based on an order and rules, which we keep hearing about over and over when it came to Russia. Uh, that was demonized. It was called like uh, some groups were calling it uh, legal terrorism, which is absolutely a uh, complete joke. So the, the world painted Palestinians into this corner and we have a right to climb out of it. We have a right to climb out of it. And I just want to add to that real quickly is that I think something else I tried to do with the piece is I really want to push away from this idea of everybody look at these really horrible pictures from Gaza and see us as a charity case or, you know, a dollar a day will feed a, a, a Palestinian. Like, no, uh, we are people with dignity. We are people who, because we know that we, our lives are worth living, we know that so much of our society and our culture is beautiful and worth protecting and worth continuing. Uh, this is why this is why we're resisting, and it's not so that we. So I think people kind of really fetishize this idea of like, oh, look, small baby Palestinians without an army, big Israeli scary. Like, yes, of course, it is horrifyingly. You know, it's this juggernaut, as I described it, of of Western support and funding and technology. But that's not a good thing. Like, we, it's not supposed to state like this idea that we're supposed to just really emphasize the power dynamic as why you should sympathize with us versus no, this is why we need more power. This is why we need more of the ability to defend ourselves. Um, I think I just really want to push against that because as like I was saying about trying to contribute this to in, in English, like the discourse among Palestinians is, was, is yeah, of course we're going to be happy <laughs> when we see uh, soldiers, like for once, for once uh, we hit them back, they used to just be hitting us. Like it, when I look at the numbers from 2008 in Gaza, from 2014, uh, from 2021, it's like this many Palestinian families or this many Palestinians lost their children and with like a couple of soldiers. It's this idea that we have to apologize that, we had like this organized like strike back is i is is kind of far from reality in a way 
Yeah, and I think you really you you had an excellent quotation that said uh, from a song. That's no. like we carry a rifle so that the next generations can carry a sickle. <laughs> we want to carry a sickle. We don't. We, nobody wants to be fighting. We we want to tend to our lands. We want to have a normal lives. Like this is not exactly like what anybody thinks of life. And the people of Gaza know that more than anybody else. But they know that if they want to reach that, like something has to change, and nothing has been changing. Very much appreciated. Um, I, you know, I do, we do want to shift. We have several other questions. Um, I, you know, people need to check out that piece. It's, it's great. It's, it's short, it's succinct. It lays it out very clearly. And Rwanda, I really appreciate you writing it. Um, I also just want to put in a plug because I meant to do this at the beginning, but go to decolonizepalestine.com, go to their Patreon. The Patreon is in the link and support their work. They've been facing, um, DDoS attacks and also just a, I think an influx of people that are checking out the website also because it's such a great resource in this time. And so, um, you know, help them with paying for upgrading their, you know, their servers and their hosting and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I hope to get a, do that. attacked y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like actually yeah. uh, multiple DDoS attacks. Like there was this IP address that was repeatedly trying to attack the website that was based in Sidorot. So it's uh, just bizarre that they're not even using a proxy. I don't know. Maybe they were, but like we were getting like a hundred thousand ticks every now and again, like from the hundred thousand hits, like just at once and the website could not handle that all of that uh fake traffic obviously malicious but yeah we we well, uh, we upgraded the, our plan yeah, we upgraded that we had another new layer of defense installed and uh, everything should be okay the website has been up now for around 12 hours everything's good so hopefully it stays that way be that as it may people should definitely support the work that you are doing it's it's very important so um let's shift a little bit to talking about the bombing of Al Ali Hospital or Baptist Hospital, I believe is how it translates. Um, you know, obviously, I, I I realize my question is more um, direct. One of the things on it, you know, when we talked about this off air before we started, right, is that there's a very real possibility we understand this having this conversation that the overlords at Google will say, yeah, we're taking this down after afterwards. And so we're just naming that. And we know that um, the position of Palestinians, um, the reality, I think, on the ground in the whole region is a deep understanding um, that Israel is responsible for this attack, right? And I think in the West, um, we have a position where our states and our media and, you know, now the National Security Coalition in the United States and, and Israel, right, are, are saying that they have intelligence that says otherwise, blah, blah, blah. We should say, of course, that this narrative shifted a ton of times in the very first couple of hours and that um, as we've seen throughout even this phase, even if you've just been paying close attention in the last uh, 12 days, the amount of disinformation and misinformation that has been put out by uh, Israel in terms of what's going on, what they are doing, that has been later been disproven, the amount of uh, lies that have been, uh, you know, disseminated regarding um, things that the Palestinian resistance was alleged to have done that actually haven't been true or have been greatly exaggerated, right? Um, there's a lot of that, right? So, and and I think we've talked about this to you before, probably in the last conversation we had with you in 2021 about the kind of history of this. This is not a new phenomenon that, uh, that the state of Israel and its media organs and such create these very exaggerated stories and lies and um, bases for their attacks. I mean, for one, we could say that the targeting of schools, the targeting of hospitals is a fairly standard practice. And that one of the um, one of the things that they always say is that, uh, you know, Hamas is in the schools or under the schools or, or whatever or in the hospitals. Right. And so these 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 justifications and this type of um, rhetoric and um, blame it really it's it's really a product of kind of blaming Palestinians for their own resistance and making it a something that can be collectively punished as opposed to actually having to seek out uh, you know troops you know um, military targets right and so um, I'll just say that and we probably you know but the thing that I'm interested in of course is that this was a huge huge event right this this immediately that night, 
you know, I, I was seeing people all over the Middle East, all over, uh, you know, Western Asia, however we want to call that region, um, you know, taking to the streets, going to U.S. embassies, going to U.K. embassies, going to Israeli embassies, if their countries had them. Um, and, you know, really very militant, very organic uh, street responses. And, you know, this has been kind of, you know, and, and I would say also in the United States that there has been um, a lot of responses in the street. I mean, people have been in the streets, our, our cities today, as we're doing this in Philadelphia, there's a group of folks that are protesting as Philadelphia is trying to pass a law or a, a resolution that says we stand in solidarity with Israel and against Hamas terrorism or something like that, right? And so um, there's a big uh, response of folks here that are protesting that right now as we speak. Um, and so that those kinds of things are going on all over. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you about how that feel this incident and how this time feels kind of in the region that you're in geopolitically. I know you both are in the West Bank. I'm interested in what the climate is there and the reverberations are there. Um, and, you know, it seems like this is this this moment, although not unprecedented in any way, um, certainly has a, a wide uh, reverberations. Yeah, well, like uh, within half an hour of the bombing, basically everybody was out of their we houses. Were in the streets, yeah. yeah. Everybody was in the streets. And what's remarkable is that I'm now I'm talking about our experience in Ramallah and the West Bank in general. What's remarkable is that when all these people gathered together and they started deciding where to march to next, should they decide to march to the checkpoints or should they decide to march to the Muqata, which is the headquarters of the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah? Uh, the majority actually decided to go and march to the Muqata because as you the Muqata sure, is the presidential yeah, the headquarters yeah. of the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. Um, because the Palestinian Authority has been playing a very negative role actually in the whole thing. It's it's pretending as if it's in a different country, like it's Norway or something, and it's trying to keep neutral. Um, Abbas even condemned Hamas and condemned everything that was going on in Gaza and then had to retract it again after public uh, outrage. Uh, he, the, so the, as usual, the Palestinian Authority is preventing people from going to checkpoints. It's preventing people from going and actually protesting the Israeli occupation. So there is this huge anger against the Palestinian Authority. And organically, all the masses that gathered out began to march towards Palestinian Authority uh, outposts in the West Bank. And we saw that in Jenin. There was even firefights in Jenin uh, uh, all over the place. A schoolgirl was, uh, like a school-aged girl was actually killed in Jenin by the uh, Palestinian Authority, so-called the security forces. Um, and I, it's, we, we recognize the connection. I think a lot of people, we see, you know, the, the tear gas and the shiny new cars, the police cars that were uh, hitting people and all this was, is uh, America funded, is uh, gets their support not from the people and uh, therefore we also see it as illegitimate but i think it's it's uh, this anger it's this uh, i think feeling people that this is we're really and truly in a point of no return um yeah like oh sorry was, someone's so, asking yeah. i think that is a question kind of worth asking. yeah okay well so, uh, the palestinian authority was the authority created okay so in 1994 there was the oslo accords uh, they tried to, or rather the establishment of the Palestinian Authority, they wanted to establish the Palestinian Authority as an interim force that would last for five years, an interim government that would just last for five years until the Palestinian state would be established. Uh, the Palestinian state has not been established, and uh, it's been, what, almost 25 years yeah. now, 30 years? I, I got 30 years. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> 30 years, yeah. <laughs> Because as a kid, I remember when the Palestinian Authority first came back to Nablus, and that was where I was living at the time. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, they're supposed to be the forces that are keeping control. Like they're supposed to be our government. Because, uh, but they actually don't have any sovereign powers. They only have administrative powers. They can't even decide who's a citizen. Like if we, when you get your your ID card or your passport, it's not because the PA gave you the permission. It's no, they, they're the office. You apply there, but they have to send it for Israel for to actually. Mm -hmm. uh, to actually give you an acceptance that yes, you are a Palestinian citizen. That's even in Gaza and even here. So that's it's a ridiculous idea to, you know, frame them as an actual real government. They're barely an autonomy group, and that's why a lot of people, you know, compare them to the Bantustan authorities in South Africa. Uh, but the thing is, after um, they 
after that 2007 and 2008 when Hamas basically uh, separated and had its uh, uh, took power over in the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian Authority has been very, very uh, scared of that happening here. So they've been cranking down very, very heavily. They've been become very, very strongly uh, repressive. They have, and of course, with the support of the EU and the United States, they have, I think, like a huge chunk of their budget goes to security apparatus. I think they have 70,000 uh, actual pieces of high-grade weaponry, but they only come out, they're only aimed at Palestinians. So when Palestinians were like, hey, you have these weapons, why don't you go actually start something in the West Bank to support Gaza? Defend us, because the silence. settlers are everywhere. The settlers are... are just... yeah, yeah. You don't even need to go and like share with anything that's going on in Gaza. The settlers have been, even before the 7th of October, the settlers have been going out and burning down towns around the West Bank. Like people, some people are even calling it pogroms and such, whatever, Bastiani. Um, they have been going out and Ben Gavir has been giving them weapons. They have zero kind of, uh, they have carte blanche basically right now to do out, go out, do whatever they want. They killed a couple of people. They came back the next day to the funeral, killed the rest. There's absolutely nothing that they, they won't get away with nowadays. And the army, of course, only intervenes to protect them, not to stop them. Because some people are asking, why, what isn't the army, the Israeli army, supposed to be keeping order in the West Bank? No, it's not. It's there to protect the settlers, and it's a colonial force. It does not care about Palestinians. So, so that, that we getting that off our chest, but to connect it more to the, the wider region, I think it was kind of incredible seeing the the protests. I want like specifically in Egypt and Bahrain, because these are both countries that are not very easy to protest in. But the, like you said, just very organic, this anger, this feeling I definitely felt. And I'm sure and I don't think I'm even remotely alone in this, is that if a Palestinian child in 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 Gaza can uh, or has to be dealing with airstrikes, with seeing their, their family members killed. If we have like a little girl writing, I, this is something that really I think is going to haunt me, frankly, for a long time, but a little girl wrote a will. Um, She's one of the, she was one of the victims of the hospital uh, bombing. She wrote a will saying she had like 80 shakens and she wanted some to go to her mom and some to go to her friends and my clothes and uh, please wash my shoes before you give it away to, uh, uh, people more in need. Uh, if if she can go through all that, then we can deal with whatever the repercussions are. Frankly, in in because the the repercussions are there and they're there in, in the West too. I don't want to just talk about Egypt, Bahrain, uh, Germany, where you can't even hold a sign that says uh, "Stop genocide" because they've really made up for their past, apparently. Um, and in, in the US, where we see. It, it, the tear gas and the arrests and all this, like, but we know, but we feel that we we need to hold some of the 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 load off of them, and that this is this is worth it because they're they're losing everything. We can maybe lose a little bit of uh, supporters or I don't know income or uh, these kind of other things that people are giving up now. Mm -hmm. and I yeah. think it really it really hammers in how much uh, regionally, at the very least. Or not just regionally, internationally. Uh, how sympathies, the normal people's sympathies, like the, the general people's sympathies are with Palestinians. Like uh, in the Arab countries, at the very least, we're talking about uh, Amman and Amman, like all yeah. these protests going to the Israeli and the American embassy, because they also realize that without the US support, uh, there could be no Israel, basically. Um, and it's not a coincidence that these were also the, the same targets that every time there's, you know, a kind of revolution that, or something in Arab countries, uh, these are also the same first targets because they have they have no popular base. They have institutional power uh, with the Arab uh, governments and their normalization, but this is the people always have been and always will remain with Palestine. And I mean, have you ever seen? Have I? I don't mean. The second Intifada, maybe there were some, but ever since then, I can't remember the last time I saw a mass pro-Israel protest that was like tens of thousands of people. Like, when was the last time we ever seen that? I don't remember that. Maybe honestly during the second Intifada, that's what, 20 years ago. But all over the world, there are people going out and cheering for Palestine. So I feel like it. we have a difficult struggle ahead of us. 
Um, but I don't feel like they would be coming down so heavy and so heavy handed if they weren't actually generally afraid. And I'm talking here about governments in Europe and the US about how they've been dealing with these protests. I don't think they'd need to silence us that badly if they weren't genuinely worried about growing sympathies and solidarity with Palestinians. It definitely feels hysterical and it feels that they, they've been trying to put off a ground invasion because they're realizing that the armed resistance has become that much uh, stronger that's why you resort to uh, bombing bakeries. That's why you resort to uh, leveling uh, residential buildings. But for, yeah, for sure. Like if somebody 10 years ago told me that uh, the Israelis were too afraid to uh, invade Gaza, I'd be like, get out of this. Get out of here. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? This is a complete flip of power. And the fact that Hezbollah has also been bombing from the north, they've been shooting tanks, and I think they've killed like, what, 30 or 40 soldiers up to this point. Like, ne never has Israel been taking this kind of casualties and like letting it slide because they can't open a fr two fronts at the same time. So like the idea that this invincible Israel has definitely been crushed by the past couple of weeks, like this invincibility myth that's been built and drilled into everybody's heads, it's completely gone. And I think it's only the, the, the balance of power is only going to, to change going forward in the future. Which is really saying something because the thing is about also just kind of connecting to the previously you know stated idea of uh, you can't equate the oppressor and uh, the, the oppressed. Um, oh God, sorry. I forgot what I was going to say. Please. Continue. No, it's okay. But I think it's, it's really speaks to the difference about a people like, uh, an army trying to maintain its privileges and, and, and somebody struggling for survival. I think that's a huge difference in like the motivation to fight and in, in, in how hard you fight. Oh, sorry. Now I remember. Okay. About the oppressor versus the oppressed is that their whole society is, is, militant like they have this the the conscription uh they're passing like these uh, settlers are again like they have arms and they're very they're very much encouraged to use them uh there is no such thing as you know them being held accountable we've seen so like over the years we have watched uh, you know the the settlers uh, murder like kidnapping and murdering children and uh, and kind of waging these attacks on us and that's despite the fact that they're or that's encouraged by the fact that their society is is all like Ben Gurion, I believe, was the one who said it. Like the whole uh, nation is the army. Uh, they, it's very much a part of the Israeli identity. It's very much a part of you know there, why there are so many consequences for trying to uh, not be conscripted, or uh, the fact that there's there's all these like career and other related incentives for being part of the army, and all of that comes with this idea of you know seeing every Palestinian as the enemy uh seeing that their existence depends on the negation of ours so uh, i i don't know if that connects very well with what we're saying now but i just wanted to remember to say that but and yeah but that's kind of what has been eroded i think in this past week yeah this for is... sure and, and i think if we want to play by the same rules that they're playing that uh their idf bases all over inside cities and inside settlements and such forth. So like if they, they always justify bombing us that there's, oh, somebody knew Hamas or somebody was next to Hamas or somebody knew Hamas's uncle's brother or whatever. Like they always give these intricate explanations like, oh, uh, since Hamas is the government there, this means that uh, this uh, hospital is technically run by Hamas, so it's a terrorist target. If we were to take their logic and apply it consistently, the majority of the Israeli people would be military targets as well. But obviously, there's no, there's no, uh, it, it, that's not the point of propaganda. Propaganda doesn't care about right. actually being consistent. Yeah, I wonder, it just, it feels like regionally the, there is more of this anger, like face towards like this, um, to to connect to what the, I think this hospital bombing, what it kind of represents to us. It feels like, you know, they, we can't sit and watch them destroy all of all of Gaza and uh, so many I think so many of these people who are coming out against their governments who even even a McDonald's in Istanbul just like this kind of idea of what right. is represented by American corporations like McDonald's um, and the fury a lot of people had over the I believe McDonald's Israel donated a million meals to the Israeli army and people were furious about that um, I, I think this uh, is kind of really scary to a lot of people, even in, in Jordan, um, the, the cancellation of, of talks uh, with the US. Uh, it definitely feels like a really huge shift. Um, I can't even remember the last time I saw protests in these numbers. Uh, and it's, it's, it's definitely meaningful. And I think uh, 
emotional for us, especially looking at, you know, so many Palestinian refugees in Jordan, seeing them going to the, the borders like that. Uh, there's this very much this idea that's very palpable of like, no, it is our, our, our land and we could really picture us returning in our, in our lifetimes. I think, thank you for all of that. I think that's critical for context for everybody, especially folks in the West that may not be seeing all of those, uh, those images, those videos, um, because if you're not following, you know, Palestinian accounts or accounts in the Middle East, then it's probably not <laughs> going to be, you know, registering on, on mainstream news, of course, because they're painting a very different picture of all of this. Um, so in addition to the piece and what we just laid out, you both are co-creators of Decolonized Palestine, as we've already talked about. Um, this is an essential website for political education around this, which we've talked about as well. Um, so there, there, there's another thing that you do here, which we did mention, which is you, you debunk a number of myths. And I think this is really critical because there's so much mythology, so much mystification that goes on around the Israeli settler project, what it is, its history. Um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, every nation has this, by the way. The United States has plenty of mythology and propaganda that we all know about its history. Um, and a lot of the recent, you know, for instance, Republican attacks on, you know, teaching uh, AP black history or, um, you know, critical race theory, so-called things like this are also attacks in our con in our context over the actual teaching of the reality of United States history. So um, we should be clear, it's not specific strictly to uh, Israeli as a nation state. But um, there are a couple of things that come up frequently in this, and I welcome you all to add more as we get into this, but um, just recently a number of myths that are being very widely used and and by our country, by the West, um, by Israel itself. Um, one is just this myth that Israel is defending itself, um, and relatedly this idea that Israel has a right to exist, which Israel is the only nation state that I've ever seen say that <laughs> it has a right to exist. Um, so you have sections on both of these myths in on your website, uh, one on the idea of Israel defending itself, self-defense, um, and also on this so-called right to exist. So could you just take a few minutes um, and talk about these two myths, why they're myths, and, um, you know, what you make of them? You want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I think it's kind of absurd to think of an occupying power defending itself from the people it occupies. Like, how how does that work? You have us at gunpoint, you have your boots on our neck, and any kind of struggling, that's the thing that requires retaliation. Um, this is the whole this is the whole illusion that the that is trying to be built that the Palestinians and the Israelis are like two different neighboring countries and they're just having like some kind of land dispute or as people would say it's an ancient you know religious war because that's how people think about it I think that's like it's a convenient way to think about it because it's easy it doesn't make it allow it allows them to kind of like deep plug and be like oh this is way beyond my understanding therefore it has nothing to do with me yeah it's just like oh these are just you know religious fanatics killing each other oh religion oh you you know that that kind of uh, boring, you know, uh, Dick Dorkin's uh, <laughs> breed <laughs> of uh, you know new atheism and such. But um, uh, if there's one thing that people need to internalize when we're talking about Palestine is that we're not talking about two countries. We're not talking about two countries. We're talking about a settler population that came from abroad in the 30s and the 40s, and they established an entity in the middle one. of. Uh, already inhabited area and the demographics were not in their favor so what did they do they kicked out the people already there that is as simple as it is we're not talking about the jewish people by the way the historical jewish people we're talking about zionist settlers because there were jewish palestinians living here and there are actually jewish palestinians that fought in the plo against zionist settler colonialism um, there are also islamic bedouin tribes that fought with the zionist settlers so to be able to look at it and be like oh this is a religious word that's nonsense it flattens everything down it kind of removes all the motivations it removes all the justifications so i think this is something that's important to understand so when we say that uh, the green line, which is the borders between, quote unquote, Israel and the West Bank, uh, when people cross, it's not a real border. It doesn't exist for Israelis. It only exists for Palestinians. Uh, when we talk about Israel's building settlements in the West Bank, people talk about it as this huge violation. But 
all Israeli cities are settlements as well. Like there are no like there are no cities that were there that originated like before Zionist settler colonialism inside of Israel. The ones that do were Palestinian cities like Nazareth, like Yaffa, like Haifa. These were all Palestinian cities, which also, by the way, did have Jewish populations, normal Palestinian Jewish populations, but not Zionist settler Jewish populations. That's something that's very important to distinguish between because a lot of people want to come out and say that Oh, these are, uh, there have always been Jews in Palestine. Well, yeah, of course. And they've, it's, nobody ever denied that, but that's not the issue. So when we're talking about self-defense, to bring it back, uh, the colonized, like how is the colonizer defending itself against the colonized? It doesn't make any sense. And even if you want to go across the international law, uh, which is something that a lot of people are very skeptical about, including ourselves, obviously, international law has done zero to protect Palestinians, but it's often wielded against us. Um, the occupation of the West Bank gas strip is completely illegal because it is uh, a permanent occupation. Uh, you don't occupy something temporarily and then you transfer hundreds of thousands of settlers into it. You don't invest billions of dollars into it if it's temporary. Uh, the Geneva Conventions are violated every day. That is if you want to take an international law perspective. Uh, but uh, yeah, like just the whole, like legally, morally, from every single way, it's absurd to think of Israel defending itself. It doesn't make sense. And I think also just that we need to ask, what is it? actually like when we say israel what does it mean that that is being defended it is again it's not a worthwhile political project if you believe that all human beings are equal and uh, all have an inherent sense of uh, dignity and uh, the rights to to life and safety and health and all these things it's it's not as so long as there is zionism palestinians cannot be fully humanized or cannot be fully allowed to exist so it's is it worthwhile to have this idea of uh, Palestinian Muslim and Christians are worth less? Uh, this idea that someone with a Jewish grandmother in Poland can come and live in the house of a Palestinian who her and her grandchildren are still living in a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. This is not an idea worth defending. It's uh, it's it's antiquated. It's immoral. It's uh, that is what the actual violence is. I want to yeah. have you Sorry. clarify something for folks. No, this is important because I, I, I know this. I think a lot of our audience knows this, but I don't think everybody knows this, which is like you've mentioned uh, a few times, like sort of the rights of Jewish people within Israel and how that, you know, and, and then non, you know, non rights or non citizenship for other folks. So just explain for folks the kind of legal apparatus of that, of like, of citizenship of like you know non-citizenship and and how that functions within israel because i i don't think that i know most people that are listening probably understand it but i know that all people do not okay well they're very happy to clarify that yeah yeah um there are basically territories each territory has its own context has its own laws we have the west bank we have the gaza strip we have east jerusalem and we have what they call israel 48 uh so each of these areas has its own context each of this area has its own government basically at this point uh but the thing is palestinians in the west bank and gaza strip are not considered israeli citizens they're considered palestinian citizens we're supposedly under the rule of the palestinian authority which is basically a puppet for israel in the first place uh now when we talk about palestinians inside israel or the zionist entity uh, those are basically the Palestinians that somehow one way or another survived being ethnically cleansed in 47, 48, and again in 67. Uh, but here's the thing. People say that Israel grants equal citizenship to all its citizens. And this is a very clever rhetorical trick. It's also another myth on the site. There's another myth as well. Because in Israel, they distinguish between citizenship and nationality. Like usually these things are usually used interchangeably most of the places, like colloquially at least, not legally. Uh, your citizenship is everybody's equal as a citizen, but a big chunk of your rights come from your nationality. What determines your nationality? Your ethnicity. So in Israel, you can be a Jewish national, you can be a Druze national, uh, Christian, Muslim, what have you. Uh, but this cannot be challenged. This cannot be changed. This there's slash no, religion. Yeah, there's no, well, they look at, because they, they, they really conflate an it, ethnic, yeah. religious group, they conflate ethnicity and religion together. Um, so uh, the, the idea is that 
uh, if you are born as a Jewish Israeli, your rights are going to be yes, exactly. Hence, the ethno state. If they're born as a, if you're born as a Jewish Israeli, your rights are going to be much different than a Palestinian that was born inside there. Uh, you get a lot of things having to do with serving in the army. You have a lot of benefits from, for example, getting land or leasing land. There's numbers that say that uh, pa Palestinians were supposedly equal citizens. Uh, around 85% of the entire country is off limits to them to actually rent or lease land there because the majority of the control of the land is under organizations such as uh, the Jewish National Fund, which very openly says we only lease land to people for the Jewish people, not for any for citizens. There's no civic civil like there's no civic culture in israel it's very national based it's very ethno national based and that has people like oran yiftah if you want like very nitty gritty uh to, to read about it it's, they he called an ethnocracy which is basically a state that is built to privilege one ethnicity over each other, but it still has a democratic facade. But this democratic facade would be destroyed if the demographics shifted a little bit, which is why Israel is incredibly obsessed with demogra demographics. Like uh, uh, they have, there's a law in Jerusalem that's running in from the 70s. It was uh, it was started by a commission called the Gaffney Commission. It was a governmental commission. It said we need to maintain the Palestinian population at this threshold, and we need to maintain the Jewish population at this threshold, and since then, they have been doing everything for, for to kind of get Palestinians out of Jerusalem legally uh, through not granting permits, not allowing them to build new homes, to make uh, areas so poor that they have to go to neighboring villages or towns. And at the same time, they're building exclusive Jewish settlements uh, inside of Jerusalem to boost this demographic shift. So it's like an incredibly very racist and very, you know, 18th century blood and soil ideology. That's, I mean, that's where it was born in Europe in the 18th century and 19th century, sorry. So like it, it tracks, it completely tracks. And I think we are a little bit lost. Uh, no, no, I want to add question. that uh, Adala, uh, there's this group, A-D-A-L-A-H. Um, they are kind of tracking the sort of uh, the violent, sorry, the racism and discrimination against the Palestinians in 48, which has included even a public pool where the Jewish residents had, uh, had like they were outraged at Palestinian Arabs being allowed to go to the same pool as them. Um, a, a lot of different cases, like if we want more specifics, definitely go uh, visit their site. They've really tracked this. That's why their work is very, um, you know, attack that's why it's very difficult for them to have people work for them really uh but they've done a really incredible job doing that i would say uh so that's part of it part of it is again if you're a west bank palestinian unless you are one of the lucky people to get a permit you weren't allowed to go visit jerusalem if you were in Gaza, it was even harder that's why there's so many cases per year of uh, palestinians in gaza who needed very specialized medical care not the materials were not allowed to be you know imported into gaza to provide them the care there so they're on this very long list of being allowed to leave the strip in order to go to jerusalem or to go to the west bank for care there it controls your like all of this is just controls your movement it's very tiered um and it, it just kind of like it, you're just kind of told over and over again that you are uh not allowed freedom of movement that you are worthless if you do not if you are not a jewish person with Israeli citizenship yeah it, honestly the pool story specifically really made me think of of jim crow um yeah but you know you know how they they also like it's kind of like the same thing with the citizenship and the nationality they also have this other you know rhetorical trick where they hide that they say well the there's no discrimination allowed in the basic law which is basically their constitution they say that there this is not allowed but what they do is that they have a new law that said that every community gets to determine who's allowed into their community and if it's a jewish community they don't allow arabs in so treating it like a gated community but who is the gate supposed to leave out That's so it. it's not it's not legal to say you're not allowed in, but the community can say, well, they don't fit our culture. And this is like, for example, a secular kibbutz, or this is a religious settlement. So we don't want non-religious people. But in practice, this means that Israel is one of the most segregated countries in the world. Like Arab villages have very, very few Jewish people living there. And Jewish cities have very, very, if any, uh, Palestinians living there and the only exceptions were the ones where the Palestinians were already living when the settlers started uh, moving in like Haifa or uh, Nazareth or uh, Yaffa. In Haifa very recently there was actually a case of kind of like mob violence of uh, Jewish Israelis attacking a Palestinian man with a 48 citizenship just for being out and about really um, and which is kind of something that 
those Palestinians there have come to expect and to know that there's never going to be any kind of repercussions because the Israeli police told this man who was beaten so badly he had to go to the hospital. Well, they thought you were a terrorist. What are you going to do? Um, so somebody asked a question here and I want to get to this. And also somebody asked a question or left a comment the other day, which was we did a, a discussion and we talked about Zionism and we talked about Judaism and we talked kind of about origins and, you know, like you said, uh, Fati, like, you know, these these ideas that came about in the 19th century and, you know, a specific conservative, most conservative answer to the so-called Jewish question within Europe um, produces Zionism, right, as a, as a kind of um, ideology or framework. And somebody asked, you know, sort of, well, what about African Jews, right? Or, you know, and, and here always, there's, all, there's Arab, yeah. yeah, they're talking about Arab, Arab Jews here. The the comment the other day asked about African Jews. So I wondered if we could say a little bit about uh, African and Arab people in this context as well, that may be Jewish, and, and like, kind of how that relates historically and currently, um, you know, and, and obviously, there's Afro Palestinians as well. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so to say, like on the kind of immediate level, a lot of the Jewish Israelis of a back, like a Moroccan or other kind of Arab background, um, they definitely if if there's been so many cases of them either being killed or beat because someone thought they were Palestinian because like a kind of whatever look similar. There's that. Um, obviously, uh, something else that's been really written about is uh, Yemeni Jews whose um, children were kind of like kidnapped to be raised in a Ashkenazi white family, Ethiopian Jewish women who were sterilized. So it's definitely something to note that because the root of it is so, you know, European and colonial, like the very idea of, of Zionism, the way that it started, you know, came to be as this like political ideology uh, is why that there's this tier, like there's this idea of the ideal uh, Jewish person or the ideal Jewish Israeli. And it's Ashkenazi, it's blonde and blue eyed, quite literally. Um, I know what... Yeah, but legally, they're all considered Jewish, so yeah. they get all these benefits as yeah, well. For sure. But, but we within didn't... Israeli society, there's segmentation. Like, like Palestinians at the bottom, for sure. <laughs> like, we just really want to emphasize that. Like, these issues are over there, like, they are still, you know, enfranchised in, in that way. Um, but I think it just kind of speaks into why, like, this is how they kind of connect to kind of American uh, kind of imperialist or colonial... Um, yeah, it's kind it's, of understanding. It's, it's definitely Ashkenazi dominated society. It's definitely that to the point where um, Jewish people from Arab countries or Arab origins, like the, they're called, I think, Mizrahi Jews, um, they, they, they are forgetting how to pronounce letters that have always been in their vocabulary just because Ashkenazis can't. That's why they in Israel they call Hamas, even though Hebrew has the ha sound, the correct ha sound to say Hamas. It's it exists in Hebrew because Ashkenazis couldn't say it. Everybody started pronouncing it as a ha. So even the people originally, like from North Africa or from Iraq, who could pronounce everything correctly, are kind of like destroying their own heritage to fit in better with this Ashkenazi-dominated society. And this is just like one level of how, like this is honestly could read books about like this different stratification sure. of Jewish people inside Israel itself, not to mention even how it deals with other ethnic groups or other religious groups or Palestinians for sure. Mm. And even among Palestinians, yeah, I mean, I'm sure the Gazans are at the very bottom of even Palestinians compared to, for example, uh, Palestinians in the West Bank or Palestinians from East Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, I think it's kind of a byproduct of how much they necessarily have to dehumanize us. In order to dehumanize us, you'll see like a lot of like Zionist supporters be like, Arabs teach their kids this, Arabs are backwards about women, or Arabs are backwards about this. Like they, they demonize Arabness. So obviously for, you know, a uh, Jewish Israeli who's from originally from Morocco or from these other places, it's not something to be proud of. And it kind of like, it's, it's this nationality that is not a melting pot i mean we criticize that in the us as well but it's it's kind of just to have this singular identity that is very you know artificial really and and uh, for a kind of violent end yeah they try to create this new entity uh, out of nothing basically and yeah. everything goes into that 
and it's also really the the obsession with demographics too like uh, there's kind of uh, palestinians are always joking about these uh there have been big russia is a language that's really spoken a lot in israel now because so many this kind of wave of russian immigrants and the kind of joke is that it's kind of obvious that they're not even jewish but they're so desperate for this kind of demographics to kind of beat us and that they can't exist as a state if the Palestinians outnumber them too much, that they were started letting in people with just kind of like this flimsy, really, connection to, to Judaism. Yeah, and they yeah, go through a I, lot of issues, actually, when they get into Israel, because their religious authorities don't mess around, for example, with marriage or for other things. Um, you need to have like strong, uh, like you have to prove strongly that you are actually Jewish, of Jewish descent, not just like, for example, somebody who converted or such. So there's a lot of issues about that as well. Or like the conversion has to be in very specific, like yeah, yeah, and and we did methods, yeah. we did talk about that also with our conversation with uh, Morgan R. Tukina um, as well, which is on our page. She really breaks down that history too of like certain points in time when there was this demographic panic, and they said, "Oh, well, we'll relax these rules around you know how many Jewish relatives you have to have, and et cetera, you know." And so, um, you know, and we understand this in the United States, too. I mean, the United States also has a history of like shifting its immigration laws in order to uh, deal with the demographic concerns of of white domination, white supremacy within, you know, our nation state as well. Um, and obviously, you know, if it's much harder for a refugee from Haiti to access the United States than it is for a refugee from Ukraine to do so, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I don't think we touched adequately yet though on uh israel has a right to exist which i think is a is a very oh. important one to to for us to touch on um and i think you know i know you will make this distinction but obviously here we're saying we're not saying people don't have a right to exist or the people that are within the nation state of israel we're saying that uh the the nation state itself which is the way that this gets invoked and so yeah i would just be interested in in what your thoughts are on that one well, first of all, sorry, I don't know if you can hear. There's a lot of construction going on, but hopefully it's not coming out. Um, basically, no state has a right to exist. It doesn't. It's not a thing. It's not. It's literally not a thing in international law. It does not exist. I mean, what does it mean? Who who enforces it? Like, what, if I said Canada has a right to exist, what does that mean? Like, it doesn't mean anything. Exists as what? But the thing is, is what Israel really focuses on is that it wants a right to exist as a Jewish majority state. And it picked the wrong area to start a state if you wanted to have a Jewish majority because it's already inhabited. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Um, the thing is, when people say that it's something you touched upon, like when people say that no, like Israel doesn't have a right to exist, they start thinking, oh, well, you're calling for a second Holocaust. That's why you're doing like, And this is very disingenuous because it's not even like, if you want to go back and even look at the PLO's papers from the, the 70s about talking about, because they started talking about one state back then, by the way, like one democratic state for everybody. Nobody talked about kicking out everybody or massacring everybody. But I mean, when you when when simple, you know, tactics like BDS are likened to Nazi Germany, you know, boycotts, it's it's difficult to actually, you know, talk to people in good faith because that's not that's not what they want. A lot of cases, a lot of like pro-Israel apologists. So there's, I, I mean, there's no such thing as a state's right to exist, and definitely not at my expense. Like, why does your state deserve to exist at the expense of me? Like, why should I have to live in a refugee camp for all of my life because uh, you don't want certain demographics or certain demographic levels? Like, if your state is threatened by equality for everybody you rule, does it deserve to exist? Should it exist? why so these are like kind of like uh, the the it's 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 a ridiculous and it's like you said nobody ever brings it out for any other context never it's also this idea that every single minority everywhere should have their own state or else uh, they're all gonna perish is we don't apply that to any other group there are many oppressed uh, groups in the world um and this idea that we have to fragment everything and everyone and okay because uh, muslims and jews and christians can't possibly be neighbors without killing each other it's it's not it's very backwards thinking what we need is we need reparations we need to redress uh, the justice we need to redress the fact that um, these privileges were given to this one group uh you know at the expense of another but we kind of saw a version of that with south africa a lot of afrikaners decided that rather than live in equality with black people they would rather leave mm -hmm. Wasn't because they were 
kicked out. They, they, a lot came to Israel. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Africaners came to like. And when you talk about reparations, you mean after decolonization, not yeah, like, yeah, not yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It, there needs to be justice for the fact that the the even from the like we talk about houses, but even they didn't leave us our books. Like they when they came and they they took people's uh, libraries, they deemed it all absentee properties. Um, even as like we're talking again, forty eight now, when those refugees tried to come back from Lebanon and Syria, they were many of them were shot at, many of them were imprisoned, and then literally put in trucks and dumped on the border. We that needs to be redressed, but that's not because like that's not a really terrible ask, I don't think. Like yeah, and I think it's it's a little bit disingenuous, like the ways that things get framed, like uh, for example, from the river to the sea and such and other chants, you know. Uh, because everything a Palestinian does is is automatically framed as genocide. Like it's ridiculous. And if you actually look at, you know, historical documents from the 20s and the 30s, there were so many offers for a unitary state, and they were even considering giving like the Zionist uh, movement like half of the parliament, which is ridiculous considering that there were barely 30 percent of the population. But like these offers were made. But uh, it's just um, even at, at one point during the 48 war, Syria offered to take in all Palestinian refugees for good, for good. It would have ended everything about refugees. In return, Syria would want to maintain uh, like its rights, fishing rights in the, the Tiberias uh, Lake. And Israel rejected that because it wanted all the lake for itself. Like it's it's stuff like that that like really hammers in like how one sided history has been taught for so long, how so many myths have come to be seen as, you know, conventional wisdom. And it's ridiculous. And a lot of this conventional wisdom comes from trying to fit biblical narratives into history as well. Like they try to make like the history of today fit the biblical narrative, even though a lot of that doesn't actually stand up to archaeology or any historical evidence. But. Here we go. Here we. That's what we're living with. We're dealing with people uh, arguing with us every day that some ancestor ten thousand years ago. No, not ten thousand years ago. That's too much. Three thousand years ago established something here, so that's why they deserve to kick us out. Not even mentioning that the land has been inhabited at least fifteen to twenty thousand years ago, but that doesn't seem to matter. And also, because I know we're going to talk about this. I don't know if right now or if you want to bring this up later, but uh, this this kind of equivocation of Israel existing with Jewish safety and this idea and even from like pro-Palestine people being like why are we paying for the crimes of Germany it kind of covers up the or it hides why there was this British support for Zionism and it had nothing to do with caring about Jewish people it had nothing to do it predated the Holocaust and it had nothing to do with this act of safety it was just quite frankly like the you know Theodore Herzl he's he appealed to British uh, imperialist figures saying that you will have like uh, kind of an outpost in the Middle East. We are closer to you than those uh, unwashed native Palestinian hordes, those Arab hordes. Uh, we share the same Western values. And uh, this is why, and we are going to take care of the land better. We're going to utilize it more. These people don't even know how to, they, we're going to take this desert and make it bloom, kind of like all oh, this kind of amalgamation, if you will, of these ideas that none of it has anything to do with, with you know, a redress of, of anti-Semitism in the first place. It was just about, you know, like these interests. I mean, Balfour himself was a raging anti-Semite. Oh, right. Like his, <laughs> his quotes about anti-Semitism is just really bizarre that we now we, we're the ones who get lectured about anti-Semitism when the so like these pogroms were happening in Europe and these ideas didn't go away. I think that's an important point because, you know, I mean, Fred Moten in talking about this, this right to exist talks about, um, you know, Israel as an artifact of European anti-Semitism in some respects, you know, of, of that, that in the same way that we can understand that the idea of Liberia or Sierra, Sierra Leone were anti-black, uh, that these were attempts to, 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 exile people out that were unwanted within the West, um, that, you know, that Israel has shares a similar history. And so you have a kind of interest convergence, right, where you do have people who are, um, you know, Jewish Zionists who are taking a very conservative approach to the sort of national question of Jewishness within Europe, um, who are saying, well, give us a nation over there. And then you have people who also 
hate Jewish people who are anti-Semitic who say, yeah, this is an excuse for us, one, to, uh, you know, to help us geostrategically. This helps us with our imperialist aims, have an outpost here, but it also helps us to get rid of populations that we don't want in our countries, quite frankly. And I think that that's yeah, They wanted less thing. Jewish people in the UK, yeah, point blank. Yeah. Um, and this was the myth yeah, that you that you brought up is is that comes up, which is also on your site, which is Israel was created as penance for the Holocaust. Right. And I think that this is a very persistent myth. And a lot of it has to do with our, our memory of the Holocaust, which is obviously one of the most horrible and devastating events in world history. We're not here to diminish that at all. Um, and shortly thereafter, the 47, 48 period, which also I think we should touch on related to this a little bit of folks just, you know, the Nakba. I mean, can you just share a little bit? Because I know a lot of people that don't know what this is. They don't, they, they know the history of the Holocaust, but they don't know the history of the Nakba. So I know that you've, you've referenced it. You, you've mentioned it a little bit in this conversation, but just quickly, if you could just outline a little bit of what that means. Okay, well, in 47, the United Nations came out with a partition plan for Palestine. And, well, it was a partition suggestion, rather. Uh, and it was supposed to split Palestine into two partitions, one Jewish, one Arab. At this point, like, things were getting hot. It had been a couple of decades where the Zionist settlers starting to gain more traction in the area. And they were sponsored by the British, who, by the way, at that point in time, Palestine was under the British mandate. So they were, the British were basically in charge of everything, the government, the army, all of that. And they were training these Zionist militias uh, and allowed them to flourish and gave them a lot of infrastructure. I just want to add really quickly there that, uh, you know, these uh, what would become like Zionist militias were allowed to have arms and be trained while mm -hmm. Palestinians were getting thrown in jail literally for if you were in possession of a stick or all these other things. So this is where the kind of the power dynamics that we see now really started to foment. Yeah. And so when the United Nations came out with this plan to partition Palestine it was obviously rejected by Palestinians, it was rejected by Arabs, uh, Arab countries. Um, as a matter of fact, it was actually rejected also by the Israelis, but not publicly. In public, they agreed to it, but they said that any uh, in private, and I know this sounds a little bit like conspiracy theory, but all we have, we have. But it's in our partition. Yeah, they, they have declassified archives of saying that any kind of acceptance of partition is merely tactical until we can expand into the rest of Palestine. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, before was the big war uh, began. Okay, one second. You can keep going. I'm just gonna yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Uh, so the, there's a big misconception that the Nakba is just 1948, but the Nakba began before 1948. 1948 is the Arab-Israeli War, okay? The first Arab-Israeli War. Uh, but, but before that, before the war even began in 47, there were around 300,000 Palestinians that were actually kicked out of their villages, ethnically cleansed and strewn to the wind before a war even began. This was a preemptive strike by the Zionist militias in Palestine, and they frame it as a civil war, but it was anything but but civil, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was this is the prelude to the Nakba. The Nakba is the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. By the end of the Nakba, there would be around between 750 to 800,000 Palestinians that were removed from their villages by force, either through uh, actual expulsions or through terror running away from them or through psychological campaigns. The Israeli armies would get these, uh, well, at the point they were Zionists, they weren't Israeli yet. The Zionist militias would get these uh, big uh, loudspeakers and they would tell them about details of massacres they were committing, like in Deir Yassin, where hundreds of people were murdered very brutally, very, very brutally, actually. Some of the testimonies are chilling, especially when you consider that the Holocaust had just happened a few years prior. We're talking about uh, a baker being thrown into his own oven, like that kind of depravity that was being committed against Palestinians. And this is all, you know, archived and documented. You can go check it out. There was also the uh, massacre. So, uh, so like it's within, so they would go out and they would go on loudspeakers and be like, hey, if you don't want to happen what they're to do, they seen with you. If you don't want us to put you in ovens, if you don't want us to kill you and such, you'd run out of your villages. These were called psychological torture or whispering campaigns. So, all of these campaigns together, it ended up with around 800, 750 to 800,000 Palestinians being expelled from their communities. Uh, the destruction of over 530 villages, they were dynamited, completely flattened. And some of them were taken over, some of them were just destroyed. 
Um, there is evidence that it's actually more than that, and the number of Palestinians is actually more than that because there were no official statistics of Palestinian Bedouins in the south, even though they were sedentary. So the number is probably, according to Salman Abu Sitta, probably 100,000 higher than that, and the village is around more than 600 rather than 530. So that is basically what we call the Nakba, and that was how Israel was established. It was even, you know, we we cover a lot of the Nakba myths on our website too. This idea that it was these were just casualties of war uh, versus what was really a systematic plan to get rid of as many Palestinian Arabs as possible. Uh, there was a massacre that happened in October 1948 in the the area of Hebron, and this is again months into you know after May and after the declaration of the state of Israel. Uh, there was a massacre, the details of which are horrifying. I wish I could remember the name of the village. Was it? Is, that's it dead. Uh, Muhim, or sorry, importantly, is just the, that was a horrifying too. And they, they murdered people in a mosque. And when the, the UN uh, tried to come and uh, check out the mosque, the Israeli soldiers said that, oh, no, you can't enter a place of worship, even though they murdered people in that same place of worship. Something that we kind of see today where they you know, they, they'll, sit, they'll pretend that they actually care about mosques and hospitals and all these things. But, you know, tracing back to when they weren't held accountable for that, they murdered people, including children, really horrifyingly. Uh, it's this the memory of this is very much imprinted, I would say, for all Palestinians. Like we all like we there's no we all know someone who is here in Ramallah, let's say, or who is not in their village because of what happened during the Nakba. Uh, it's a huge uh, collective trauma for us, and uh, it was perpetrated by these people. I think a lot of, you know, why these soldiers would come do this to us uh, when uh, some of them had survived the Holocaust themselves. There's a really excellent documentary I really, really cannot uh, recommend highly enough. It's called 1948 Creation and Catastrophe. And what this documentary does is it talks to Palestinian refugees who are alive at the time, but it also talks to Zionist militia members, and some of them explain. Some of them explain that you know it's uh, they thought it was worth it so that they could be in charge for once. It's kind of the only way to put it. Um, and it's even we see this today with this this tweet from Israel, like the strong. Like there was, I think I want to say from 2008, but the important thing is there was a tweet from the official state of Israel Twitter account that was saying this, the deals are made with the strong, and the weak are forgotten. And oh, I think it's 17, 18, something like that. Oh, really? So, More recent. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of this this idea of why this violence was in, inflicted against us so soon after the, the Holocaust. Yeah, there's definitely this whole uh, idea of when the establishment of Israel talking about the new Jewish person, the new Jewish man. Like, and they, We're going to be and, strong and not weak. Yeah, they compared them to the Ostiot, and they used to call them, like the, the Jews in the East who were... Uh, uh, and who were like uh, put into the Holocaust and they were murdered and like they were because they were weak. Like that's as a matter of fact, Holocaust survivors were shunned in the beginning when they first came to Israel, by the way, like um, for being weak and for being put inside of these camps without fighting. Accord that's according to how they looked at things. But yeah, so this is why and, and from those in the Nakba, some of those numbers, some of them were shoved inside the Gaza Strip. And the Gaza Strip population basically tripled at that point. Like Gaza, the, the province of Gaza is much larger than the actual Strip, but most of it is now taken over by Israeli settlements. Uh, so the, basically, this is how the, the population of Gaza basically got most of its population. And this is why Gazans are terrified of actually, um, because there's some talk about opening up the Sinai for them to go there into a refugee camp, or there were attempts at least, but Egypt completely rejects it. Um, and I don't think the Gazans will go for that because a lot of stories about the Nakba are about people thinking that they would be gone for a few days, a week tops, and come back after the war, after it's over, and that they would be allowed to return. But I think a lot of them, and I think this is very rational Palestinian fear in general, that if you leave, you might not be able to return. I, I want to say something about happening uh, about Gaza right now, about this supposed push uh, to push them into the Sinai. I think it was Blinken, some U.S. government who said that, oh, well, legally, they have, in, by international law, they do have the right to turn. It's like, yeah, we know. We know that we've had that right, yeah, but it, right. Not, it, hasn't, it wasn't implemented thus far. Why on earth would they, like, they're not suckers. Like, they, they, a lot of them really have the memories quite, you know, literally of thinking that they're going to come back to our house. Uh, we're only going to take the very basics to just 
for a week in Lebanon so that we can come back and then not being allowed to come back. So here it's uh, people, uh, obviously Gaza is a place that has been kind of inflicted with every kind of, you know, horror and violence and kind of collective uh, punishment, if you will. But it's it's their home. It's closer to their home uh, than Egypt, certainly. And it's not interchangeable. Again, that's not just anywhere you put Palestinians. So if it's an Arab country, it's it's fine. They saw, you know, these settlements were quite literally built on top of the remains of their villages. Like that, that is their land. And they were already getting pushed back even within the strip, like these so-called buffer zones that are like no go if you can't like, you know, there are talks now of Israel trying to push back the boundaries of the strip even further in what is already a very, you know, small, densely populated place. And that includes a bunch of Gazan's farmlands. But the point is, is that is their land. This is the way they make their living. This is who like the land is who we are. So uh, it's it was quite, you know, incredible, really, to see. I really I wish I knew Blinken. Point is, it was really incredible to see this. uh, Sorry. It was really incredible to see the mention of, oh, well, they'll be allowed to return and be expected to to believe that as a Palestinian. They basically called for the right of return. (laughs) Yeah, I think it it was a White House aide of some kind. And uh, and, yeah, but I'm not I'm not I'm not I can't you know, I've seen so many things this week. I can't say definitively, but it was someone in the Biden administration who said this. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a Does fundamental. The, right. I think was that you who did that tweet? I remember. Yeah, that was his <laughs> yeah, 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 meme. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, this is a fundamental demand of a Palestinians for the last seventy-five plus years. You know, is, is this idea that we have a right to return um, to to our homes, to our lands, um, and this is something that has a firm basis within international law. And it is something that Israel has flat out rejected all along. And I think that it highlights for many, um, you know, Palestinians understand that international law is not like a real thing that they can just attack, you know, hold on to and, um, you know, say, oh, well, we have this right because the, you know, the UN says that we have it or, um, you know, some body of humanitarian law says that we have it. These are things that unfortunately have to be struggled for because, Nobody is holding Israel Israel to account for uh, its violations of international law. Um, there's not, you know, it's hard to think of. I was trying to think of this the other day, of a country that is allowed to bomb other sovereign nation states within its, you know, in you know, around it on a regular basis, and and there is no, you know, the, there's no international response to this. You know, I mean. They just bombed two airports in Syria like last week, you know, the regularly bombing in Lebanon. Um, And I think that, you know, I mean, for folks to contextualize that, like imagine if like, you know, France or the United States was just regularly, you know, bombing countries that were around it, how this would be perceived by the rest of the world. And again, I think Morgan situated this well in our conversation. Uh, it, It gets away with these things because it is allowed to. Uh, NATO, EU, the US allow this to happen because they see themselves having a geostrategic interest in Israel's ability to, 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 you know, to be there and to, to, to be a kind of outpost, uh, military and imperialist outpost in the region. And so it is not just, you know, because Israel is um, the dog that's the, that uh, where the EU and the United States are the tail, right? It is actually the other way around, way around. Um, you know, and I think it's important for us, especially in the US, folks listening in the UK, in Canada, like our governments are sponsoring this. Our governments are saying, yeah, is I mean, Biden is there right now telling, you know, Netanyahu, whatever you need, you know, we'll, we'll give you any military assistance, you know, all of that. So I think that, um, I think that's important for us to always keep in mind here in the West, that this is not just some something that's elsewhere in the world where there's this crazy country doing these crazy things, you know, that's that's isolated from us. Um, I want to go to a couple other myths. Um, So one more that we should talk about a little bit, because you also talk a little bit about the two state solution. Um, We've brought it up a little bit here. you know, and and in some, you you hear these calls even now by certain, you know, even some Arab countries of saying, look, just give Palestinians a small state, 
um, you know, then this will go away and you can have, you know, two states and they'll have to normalize relations or whatever. Right. And um, I think that the you know, they, they won't have a right to bother, you know, Israel anymore, you know, and, and I think that this is, I, I'm being glib here a little bit in talking about this, but um, you hear these arguments, you know, when I'm talking to folks older than myself, people that I care about, who I think generally have good politics, they still often will go back to, well, it has to be a two state solution, it, it can't be a one state solution. And so, I want, I know you guys talk about this really well, and I know you've already kind of brought up some of the history of this, but help folks understand um, why a two-state solution is not the only solution and and why, um, and what a one-state solution could look like. Oh. Ah, uh, the two-state solution, it, it's, it's delusional to even still talk about it genuinely as an actual thing that can be done. Like that we are surrounded by settlements. They think like Israel believes all this land is Israeli land for Jews, like period. Um, and it, it's not like we need to get to the root of that. We can't have this like neighboring state that'll let us be and not like they they want it all and that's why these settlements have grown at the the rate that they have it's why israelis feel so comfortable talking about like these jokes that we saw i brought up in the article too but like popping up on tiktok or whatever like new oceanfront property opening it up like they they see it as all and they can't allow this neighboring state that's for the the refugees that they kicked out to actually have sovereignty <laughs> sorry that made me laugh garden um garden nomad um yeah it's it's not it's not in their it's not in their interest it's not feasible and there's a reason that even the the oslo accords like this idea that we were supposed to have the palestinian state within a few years like the reason it's gone on so much is because this this status quo of the pa kind of subsidizing the more boring or like the, let's say the more bureaucratic parts of occupation for them like that's what's actually in their interest like the, we're not going to have sovereignty we're not going to have control over our borders we're not going to have um uh we're not going to have like these actual means of of independence uh do you want to talk about the the one state more than i'll talk about i did everything. the negative part don't worry about me i'll talk about everything yeah. um yeah, but I think something important to add is that from the get-go, the two-state solution, uh, as envisioned in the Oslo Accords, um, there was never actually any kind of real uh, intent to give us a state. Like Rabin, at the time, that was the Israeli prime minister, he talked about a state minus. He wanted to basically give us autonomy so that we could take care of what Rawan called like the boring bureaucratic stuff, like the health care, taking out the, the trash, the sewage, all that administrative stuff that, you know, City Hall does, but without any of the sovereignty, without being able to have our own borders, without being able to control our own water supplies uh, or our airspaces. That was the two-state solution that was being actually. Uh, pitched to us and when Palestinians reject it we're like framed as some kind of irrational monsters like how could you reject a state because it wasn't it was never a state there was never actually never has one Israeli president uh, sorry prime minister said that they want a sovereign real Palestinian state all of them are states minus and from the get-go they're all aimed at alleviating Israeli demographic fears they're all like engineered specifically so that the Arabs, you know, the Palestinians can be stuffed in one area so that the rest of the areas can be under having like uh, good Jewish demographics. That's why they talk about transfer. Areas. Like they yeah. actually can really kind of more brazenly posit the idea of transferring out Palestinians just. Yeah, in the north, in the north, there's a lot of uh, density of Palestinians uh, living inside Israel, and they can't uh, build settlements among them because their density is that high. So they were, for a while, they were talking about transferring them to the new Palestinian state. It's completely a question of demographic. It's not like these are the equal citizens that they always talk about, how everybody's so equal over there. They're using them like, you know, chess pawns. Uh, so what is the alternative? The alternative, honestly, like, I don't, Two states, one states. I, I like. It's just. It's. It's pointless. I don't think anybody. We're not going to sit at a table and agree to a solution. That's not going to happen. I think things are going to unfold. I think de facto Israel is going to have to take over control of the West Bank eventually, uh, as the Palestinian Authority eventually collapses because its its reason for existence is gone. The two state solution is gone. So the reason for the Palestinian Authority to remain is gone. Its legitimacy is dwindling completely, and I, it cannot sustain itself, and it will collapse sooner or later. 
Um, I think through events, things are going to veer in towards Israel having an actual uh, control of the land, not just through the Palestinian Authority. If you want to talk about it seriously, if we're talking about sovereignty, they're already a one-state solution. We're already there. We don't control anything, actually. Israel controls everything between the river and the sea. It's just a, a, a racist system that is that puts Palestinians as not even citizens. But because Palestinians have been asking for statehood for all this year, the international community looks at them and says, like, oh, no, they're different. So... So what a lot of people mistakenly think when they think about the one state solution, it's not that Palestinians want to become Israelis or have Israeli passports or Israeli rights. When Palestinians talk about one state, they're talking about an actual decolonized state where nobody's ethnicity matters. Uh, so this is even something that the PLO has been saying for like since the 70s. And now obviously it's gone because the whole two state solution you know, narrative took over. Uh, but it seems that more and more people today are convinced that even some kind of I don't know, federation, confederation, which I don't think honestly is going to work either. But people are starting to think about ways uh, to to look at a new paradigm. But as Rowan, like very excellently brought up, the current status quo is much, much more sustainable for Israel than any kind of political solution. It has a five-star occupation. It doesn't have to spend anything on the occupation other than its army. Uh, it doesn't even have to have its army inside cities anymore because now the Palestinian Authority troops are doing its bidding and actually repressing Palestinian resistance. And at the end of the day, all of this is funded by the international community. The international community, with all its aid to Palestinians, goes towards subsidizing this occupation. So why would Israel ever want to change? Like, What is exactly the pressure in our hand? to change the status quo. Well, the one point of pressure was integration into the region and normalization with the region. Now they're trying to bypass the Palestinians and do that anyway. So what's happening is that Palestinians are, there. there's basically a dead end for the political horizon for any kind of actual negotiated peace, which in my opinion, it was never real, but that's a different matter. But uh, two states is again, delusional to talk about at this point. There's no way we can split this land in two states. Uh, so alternatives have to be sought. We're already living in a one-state solution, but it's an oppressive one-state solution. So talks need, need to be uh, talking about that. And I just want to kind of, I know this is a little bit fringe, but when there are some comments that I find to be really kind of flippant about like, well, what a, a no state solution where it's not, it's not about statehood. Like it's not, it's, it's about us having the power and the ability to, to with, have land back like to to have like the these rights restored and i think at the end of the day there palestinians we see all palestinians as like each other we don't see palestinians with israeli citizenship for example as like separate from from me or from a palestinian in gaza or from a palestinian in a refugee camp in lebanon or in jordan we we see ourselves as all palestinians we don't want to give up anyone's right like what makes you know, uh, what makes Ramallah more, or Ramallah villages, let's say, more of a, a, a right for us than Safad or or uh, Tiberias Tabariya or these, uh, or the Galilee, we, it's, it's all Palestine. Yeah, and the two-state solution, by the way, is something very important. It completely cuts out the refugees. There's yeah. no right of return. So, like, the majority of the Palestinian people are actually refugees. So it becomes about the West Bank and the Gaza Strip only. I mean, they don't even want to give up East Jerusalem. Like only, I think, 20% of Israelis want to give up East Jerusalem for a Palestinian capital. So like, there's no, like, it, it the cornerstone of the Palestinian cause on revolution are the refugees and the Nakba. And to ignore those and to focus instead on symptoms, I think that's a failed recipe and it can't actually ever reach anything. I, like I said, from the beginning, the two-state solution is designed to alleviate Israeli demographic fears rather than to actually try to give Palestinians a real sovereign state. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we could point to other instances of decolonization around the world and say, you know, like, you know, I mean, would people look back historically and say, you know, white Rhodesians deserved their own separate state in the decolonization process of Zimbabwe. And look, we can get into all the specifics of, you know, history and whether it's the decolonization we want and things like that. But the, the point being that um, this is a very specific argument that is made in the context of occupied Palestine um, that is not made typically uh, by people who support national liberation struggles um, in in history, right? Whether that's um, you know just the idea that Palestinians have a right to the land, they have a right to national self determination, and that that doesn't mean that, as you said, Fatih, 
um, that you want to replicate, a, you know, an inverted Israeli state, you know, or that you want to suddenly take the take some super rights, you know, and and diminish the rights of others. Um, but the difficulty, of course, is that you know you all currently, as you say, live in a one state that is a violent state. Where um, I mean, you know, even even I was reading this morning, and I don't know exactly the numbers but somebody on twitter was talking about the number of people in the west bank that have been killed even in the last 13 days palestinians by either settlers or the iof you know and and i don't know um you know the veracity of all that maybe you could speak to that a little bit but it's you know this is an area where in theory there is some um you know you have the palestinian authority etc and this is still a part of the reality yeah Honestly, I feel even as I'm seeing how long we've been on this live stream, I'm like very scared of going back to my phone and Telegram and all that and seeing what has happened in just in this past time because it's been really bad. It's been really bloody. I, even in the, the refugee camp in Turkarim, Nur Shams, there were like multiple, um, multiple martyrs, multiple. Um, it's I think I want to say the numbers reached around 80, uh, could be more uh it's it's kind of like trying to keep us in line because they are kind of terrified of our sort of uh, connection to Gaza and how we don't you know we don't see ourselves as being like in solidarity with Gaza like we are Gaza uh even I, like on the more person like yesterday I was actually at a, a funeral for uh, two Palestinians uh, who were killed in like the villages around the Ramallah area it's it feels very real it's it feels it's it's constant and uh, again there it's there isn't even the kind of glimmer of an idea that they're not like they're not supposed to do that it's just all it's very easy once once you support this rhetoric of uh, these are all terrorists and they're just uh, just very irrationally uh, attacking jewish people for no reason it gives these settlers the green light to kill as many of us as they want it, the fact that uh, toward, around the beginning of the, the lifetime that has been this week uh, they killed uh, two Palestinians in a village near Nablus, and then they came back to the funeral and they killed more people. It's uh, like it can only, I don't know, these just these, it feels like these contradictions are just. Yeah, they have carte blanche now to go out and do whatever they want. They have absolutely nobody reining them in. They can go shoot, they can go bear down villages. I mean, even even before before the 7th of October, they were already going on rampages because Bin Gavir was arming them, Bin Gavir was giving them rhetoric, Bin Gavir was telling them, go do this, go do that, and Smotrich and all these other uh, right-wing fascist Israelis. It's interesting how this uh, right-wing fascist Israeli government is suddenly the darling of the world after they were such monsters for repressing the democracy uh, protesters inside Israel, well, democracy let's say. Um, but uh, so for Palestinians, that doesn't apply, obviously. We were supposed to take it and be thankful. Uh, but uh, yeah, the West Bank is getting actually, like, because of the way the West Bank is de devised into three areas, A, B, and C, Area C is under complete Israeli control, and that's around 60% of the West Bank. So there's nobody to call. There's nobody to stop what's going on. There's no police you can call. Uh, and those are the villages that are separated and they're isolated and settlers can just go at attack whenever they want. And they tried to form self-defense committees and the army crushed those committees as the settlers were attacking because this army exists to protect the settlers. So there's there's absolutely, there's, it's a very difficult situation in the West Bank. And like I mentioned, the Palestinian Authority has around 70,000 pieces of weaponry, like modern weaponry that they are using mainly to repress Palestinians protesting against it. They shot live. They could defend rounds. their people. They could defend their people if they wanted to, but they are, they hate Hamas for one. And honestly, I think between themselves, they're hoping it collapses so they can take over Gaza again, as it used to be before uh, 2007, 2008. So there's no hope from the Palestinian Authority, which is why a lot of people are going out and protesting against it these days. And uh, yeah, the, it's it's very difficult. Like we're being separated into little cantons, basically in the West Bank. Like I, it's it's very risky to travel. Like we have a farm that's barely thirty minutes outside of Ramallah, and to go, get to it safely, we have to take a two-hour trip that goes through the mountains and such to actually reach it safely. Otherwise, there are settlers on the road, and they could shoot you, and nobody, and they'd say you tried to do a terrorist attack, or you had a knife, or I don't know what, because it's that simple to explain away why they just shot you. 
And uh, it's, I think, something striking to me because unlike Fathi, uh, part of my life was lived in the U.S. It feels the, the kind of stark difference between, okay, in the U.S., if Google Maps um, takes me a wrong turn, it's not as catastrophic as here. Like here, you do not want to go anywhere near a settlement. Like you will be in imminent danger. Um, and it's it kind of like when I think about even sundown towns, it just feels like it's like that all the time. We're so separated from everyone. We have family and friends uh, spread out uh, throughout the West Bank that we can't reach right now. We haven't been able to reach. And it's uh, to emphasize the fact that they even have this power. They decide when you can leave Ramallah or where which where you can go to, or they can stop any car and ask where you're going and do, and all these kind of things. It, it kind of again ties into that one state, a reality of like they're in charge of everything meaningful. Mm-hmm. And this is especially like, you know, my my family's village is included in that area C where they can't even um, build like they own the land or on their land. They can't even build another room in the house because the settlement right next to them told them to stop. No building permit. Uh, they took pieces of uh, my grandfather's land. They put an electric fence there and they said, oh, if you want to go and tend the trees on the other side, apply for a permit between this hour and this hour. And it's basically, you know, very uh, it's uh, de facto that you are not allowed to go do that. So it's just we've lived with this kind of like suffocating. They're in charge of you. They hate you. They don't want uh, you to have any kind of, you know, self-determination, any kind of like actual control. We've lived with that. And it just it's it's more obvious in times like now, in a way. Yeah. And I think it's important to mention that each of these different areas like the Gaza Strip, Ramallah, West Bank, not Ramallah, West Bank and East Jerusalem, each of these have, and obviously within uh, 1948 Palestine, uh, each of them have their own context. Like the, the like, there's no actual Israeli soldiers on the ground inside Gaza, for example. There's no active police force. But how they rule them is through siege, bombing, air raids, uh, uh, technology, uh, cutting off their water sources. That's how they control Gaza. In the West Bank, we have a more active, like actual, like occupation force with boots on the trail, with settlers taking over mountains, taking over hills. Um, uh, we're running out of water streams that have not been taken over by settlers, even locations that have been like picnic spaces for decades for Palestinians are being taken over that just a settler comes there and says that, well, this is mine now. And it's basically just like, uh, every random fantasy about, you know, being a cowboy in the wild west, uh, as they come and live. And a lot of these settlers are American, by the way, they come live their wild west fantasies here. Um, uh, inside of uh, the uh, 48 and in, in East Jerusalem, we see a different kind of control. There's obviously the policing force, not military force, but there's also this kind of legal strangulation and all this kind of institutional strangulation that goes around where uh, your neighborhoods get like no funding and they, uh, they leave the trash to pile up in your neighborhood, but the, na- the Jewish neighborhood next to you is like pristine. Uh, you, like all this kind of different kinds of discrimination. Like there's so many layers. There's so many contexts that it's very difficult to kind of just like explain how each area has its own uh, type of occupation or colonialism. But in the end, they're all part of the same system and they all reinforce the same system that we uh, are are fighting against currently. Just quick plug in, it's uh, for blue washing and green washing. Blue washing is the idea that Israel and I would say the US now saying that, oh, look, we're going to give some humanitarian aid to Palestinians to act as if they're actually helping us or in our best interests. Blue washing kind of covers that idea. And I bring it up because it brings up the kind of discrepancy between how we're allowed to deal with our electricity, water, medicine, or like access to medicine, like how in Gaza they, it's pretty much impossible to get rid of the toxic waste from medicine, and it's just all dependent on the Israeli occupation and greenwashing. Because I want to say around Tulkarim, uh, basically what a lot of uh, Israeli companies can do uh, that have kind of toxic waste from their production processes just goes to the West Bank, where it's more lenient, and there's even subsidies to go and do this in a settlement instead, and that's how we get some like, carcin- like carcinogenic materials dumped in, in Palestinian communities because it's too good for the Israelis in 48. Yeah, all of the dirty industries have moved to the West Bank. From, yeah. uh, like uh, the, around Salfit, the Palestinians, they, they dump their sewage on this village. Like there's a, they're on the top of the valley, they're on the top of the mountain and they dump their sewage down into the valley. So there's like this stream of uh, sewage. 
and uh, Germany wanted to donate a sewage treatment plant so for the Palestinians could actually, you know, uh, get rid of their sewage in an unrelated village. And the Israelis said, well, if you treat the sewage of the settlement with it, then we'll uh, talk about it. And they rejected. So there's no treatment for the Palestinian village and the Israeli waste keeps getting dumped on site of Palestinians. And because it's an industrial park, it's called Barkan, it's in the Salfit district. Because it's an industrial park, a lot of dirty industries is there. So their sewage is very tainted and very toxic. So the, actually the cancer rates in the villages around there are much higher than the average in the West Bank. And this is not a coincidence. Thank you for that. Um, so, and that's awful, obviously, um, I should say. Um, so in addition to decolonize palestine.com which everyone should support financially and read um can you also help point folks towards some other good places or people they should follow obviously we have both of your um twitter handles in the show notes um that can help folks get information from a different perspective um you know obviously we are in a time of you know mass disinformation and information warfare and so any suggestions that you have, I think, would also be helpful to our audience as well. Yeah, of course. Electronic Intifada's reporting is always just scathing and, and you know, unrepentant in its kind of, uh, um, you know, fidelity to the truth, let's say. Um, yeah, they have very high standards. Yeah, they, don't, yeah. they don't print anything that's Absolutely. That they're not 100% sure of. Yeah, yeah. Mondo-wise. Uh, and social media, something I've really been uh, on Instagram, at least, let's talk Palestine. Uh, just one word um i really like the way that they've been kind of making these kind of digestible uh, infographics speak in with infographics visualizing palestine they have uh, a lot of also just kind of like condensed information like about the history of gaza before the blockade in 2007 for example also just like nice quick digestible um uh, because i you know, did a lot of my my organizing in the U.S. with Students for Justice in Palestine. I know what many wonderful people work in Palestine Youth Movement and uh, National Students for Justice in Palestine. I don't know if you have anything to add. And honestly, I think like despite all the nonsense and the misinformation, if you follow the right people on Twitter, uh, I think you will have a, a much better view of what's going on than uh, just trying to follow the news. Because this past two weeks have shown that. I don't want to say they're gullible. I want to say that they're complicit. Like there's no, absolutely no way that you're this fancy, you know, uh, Associated Press or uh, Reuters uh, journalist who doesn't know that you have to verify something before running with it. Like Israeli media said, Israeli army. They don't even say that. No, no, they don't say Israeli media said. They say Israel confirms, you know, mm -hmm. or like, or not even that. Sometimes it's like, oh, evidence emerges or something. Like they're not even trying to say like, uh, there's a claim. They're just like, they're adopting it wholeheartedly and we're seeing a lot of this especially also with the hospital what's going on and uh, there's going to be a million investigations i'm sure jazeera came out with this like three minute kind of digital investigation um we're definitely going to see more i think i saw something from channel 4 news um yeah there was something on the british channel 4 news or is it english i don't know what the tv channel over there looks like i don't want to <laughs> yeah police mistake. chief said but, outrageous uh, yeah so uh the yeah sorry what was i saying police chief yes uh, oh it doesn't <laughs> comment uh the police yeah, so, investigated so, themselves no that's the thing though but but yeah but channel four did have a kind of like almost a debunking video of the israeli talk about which is, i was very surprised to see i'm sure somebody lost their head over that station like i'm sorry they really really i mean i mean obviously arabic or speakers were not the audience but still i mean at a certain point it, it was just kind of it's it's outrageous but i think it's not even i don't even know how much it's supposed to be convincing so much as it's just trying to muddy up the water just need to create doubt because it's, it, it's trying to like fizzle out the anger and kind of like divert some people's anger uh because i think seeing that kind of out organic outburst of of rage and condemnation uh, around the world i don't think that was good for them i don't think they were hoping it was going to go that way it really says something that if it wasn't for that outrage they who knows what they could have done in, in Gaza by now they could have they really truly could have flattened it, it all same reason why they haven't gotten rid of as many palestinians as they would probably like um i do think that this this stand like this refusal to um you know 
be around the bush around this or this or rather to this this refusal to act like there is like two equal sides or to you know help muddy the waters i think this really helps uh this really helps palestinians in the end it's kind of also because of journalism somebody who was very consistently calling out how even in the same headline of bbc or whatever it'll be um this many israelis killed this many palestinians died a blast talking about the hospital as if it just you know who, exploded by itself right it just kind of like this minimizing language that is really meant to to you know minimize our deaths in comparison to theirs um Mohammed al uh he writes uh, i want to say for the nation or for these other outlets uh he's been really great about calling out these journalists he has a few videos going around you know just follow him yeah. on twitter honestly he's really great, great. I think if folks follow yeah, you a, and and see who you all retweet and uh, share, then they will get a lot of these great folks as well too. Even if they can't track down all of their like at tags right now, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Francis asked a question that I was I told Francis in the chat I didn't quite understand it, but maybe she thinks you all will. So it is geopolitical oh, analysts that might be good on Iran or Russia, Ukraine, NATO are freaking out by the idea that all decisions are not made among the anti-imperialists and imperialist leaders outside address. Um, she clarified that it, it was like a inside outside distinction that she was trying to make. I don't know. Do you guys have a comment on that or? Um, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the second part of that question yeah, yeah. about anti-imperialist and imperialist. I know if, if she's just asking about what we think Iran or it might be worth just saying a little bit about, uh, and maybe maybe um, Francis will add a little bit more context in the chat, but it might be worth saying a little bit about the regional dynamics, um, you know, in terms of, I mean, obviously we've talked about the people on the ground and uh, their, you know, resistance protests, especially um, after the bombing of the hospital, but we haven't talked as much about, um, you know, Iran, uh, Hezbollah, um, and also like you know other countries maybe that that had normalized relations with israel a little bit more and how that might be shifting in the current moment you mentioned it a little bit earlier but it might be worth saying a little bit more okay well i think things need to be framed in about the current escalation right now going on i think that there is an actually a real fear for israel to go into any land invasion into gaza and i think that's for multiple of these geopolitical reasons that we're talking about um, first of all, the, the Gaza battalion that was trained for Gaza was wiped out in the, in the attack on the 7th. Uh, the, the, the guys that they're getting from the West Bank are basically uh, ward, prison wardens, like uh, like glorified. They're used to harassing teachers at checkpoints. Yeah, exactly. They're not actually combat ready. So uh, another thing is that there is actual real fear of uh, Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah, because Hezbollah has said very clearly that if there is a, a land invasion of Gaza, we will get involved more seriously. And they are actually already involved on the north. They've been, they've, I don't know how many soldiers, but they've, they've destroyed 10 tanks and a bunch of soldiers. Like I think what it was 30 or 40, I don't remember the concrete number, so don't quote me on that. But um, this is definitely playing a role. And I think all the analysts who are so convinced of Israel's superiority of arms and such, they were in for a rude awakening, like the myth of like, Israel being this invincible nation of this highly trained armies, like it showed that they're uh, they're absolutely not ready. Yes, the Gaza Battalion is an IOF force that was specifically trained around Gaza, and they're put there around Gaza to uh, basically uh, contain, keep the, them. contain the, the ghetto. Uh, and they were the ones who were getting all the trainings about how to go into Gaza if if the need comes in, like they would get the training on how to go between the houses and such. But this was all completely wiped out in Hamas's uh, attack. Like they they even have videos from their HQ, like going through it. So uh, there's real fear from actually from Iran and Hezbollah getting involved because if we're talking about Iran getting involved, that means also that we have Iraq getting involved. That means that. Uh, the United States is going to be dragged into it. So this is going to be like a huge conflagration. And the United States is already like has its uh, carriers in the area as a show of support for Israel. And that's because Israel very seriously knows that it cannot survive a two front war. It cannot survive without U.S. aid. I mean, they're calling for $10 billion right now uh, as a quick direct aid, like emergency aid, which is like 
it really shows how the tail does not wag the dog. Like it is an outpost. It cannot survive without like uh, the head of the snake. So uh, the, the, I think all of the calculations about the strength of Hamas, about the strength of the regional allies, I think that was all wrong. I think they really underestimated everything. They thought they could just normalize everything away and then have an alliance against uh, Iran. Yes, they are startled. They are afraid because all of their calculus has been uh, messed up basically by this attack. Nobody could have conceived that Hamas had this high of an organization and this like secret of an organization being able to do this without Israelis having any indication that's going to happen. Which and is the very people who, who are saying that the Israeli government knew and let this happen, I think are very off the mark. I think it's very much kind of turning the Israeli occupation army into this like amazing legend and minimizing both in the agency and also the capabilities of uh, Palestinian resistance fighters, uh, which I think it would be, it's a big mistake for them to, to underestimate them right now. Yeah, and Israel is good that... at bombing from afar. Israel is good at bombing from afar. When was the last ground invasion that they actually were able to succeed? Like the 2006 war in Lebanon, they get their asses kicked. Like they were actually completely demolished. Like they have become an army of protecting the status quo, of, protect, of residing over settlers rampaging. They're not actually combat ready. And this is, I think, the real reason why they haven't done a ground invasion, because I think they're actually terrified. Because if Hamas was able to conceal all these surprises for the 7th of October, I am sure there are much, much more deadly surprises waiting for them inside Gaza if they actually dare to go inside. Yeah, and I think that you made that point about this idea that Israel allowed it to happen. I mean, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, I understand and I think, well, some well-meaning people are, have spread that. But I do think it it actually connects with the kind of um, conspiracy theorism that also connects with anti-Semitism as well sometimes. And this idea that, like, you know, that that in order to take over Gaza, basically, that, um, you know, that that basically, you know, Israel allowed this to happen so that then they could respond this way, you know, and, and I think that that, um, you know, well, it's, I don't know, an interesting theory in some ways. It, it doesn't seem to to square with several realities, I don't think. Um, they don't need that. They don't, they don't need an excuse. They've been, quote unquote, mowing the lawn every few years as it is killing thousands of Palestinians. I don't think they need actually to do that. But uh, just a, a something that I thought about regarding the geopolitical and regional international dynamics, um, Zelensky is very desperate to put an end to this because this is diverting aid away from Ukraine, or at least he thought, but now Biden's calling for 100 million, 90% for Ukraine, 100 billion, sorry. Was it? No, was it billion or a million? I, I think it was billion, right? 90 billion for Ukraine, 10 billion for Israel, I think, yeah. Uh, so Zelensky was worried that uh, any attention away from Ukraine or from the United States is, is going to be very damaging. So we have also Russia playing a role in that way in that uh, it's going to have less NATO weapons to deal with uh, in the future if this keeps going on. So it's like it's it's a big it's a big chain it's a big domino everything affects everything but one thing is clear is that American hegemony hasn't isn't what it used to be it's very clear from that like uh, people were talking about the rise of China like I'm sorry it's all it's 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 here like I'm sorry the American empire is 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 drowning it it can't keep up its fronts it can't it can't feed its people but it can spend all these billions on war like it's it's going to collapse under its own contradictions at some point in some way. And I think we are actually living the beginnings of that. Well, we do have a few other things in the chat, but we've we've had you guys on for two hours now, and I know that you do have uh, it's it's evening there, um, and um, uh, you do also, I'm sure, have to check up on friends and family and comrades in the region, and um, so we want to allow you to to go at this time, but. Just want to really thank you for joining us for this conversation. You know, it's a real pleasure and an honor um, to have you both on and to be able to share so much, um, you know, really good information with people, debunk some of the really um, persistent myths, demystify some of our, you know, misunderstandings in the West about this situation. Um, before I do let you go, there was one other question I did want to ask. And if you, you know, I know you can't tell people like what to do, right? But I do also know that both of you, um, you know, have been 
think, you know, part of this for a long time, um, I know, as you said earlier, Rowan, you referenced uh, your time with Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, you know, what do you think in terms of the current moment, in terms of what people in different places should be, um, you know, thinking about in terms of how to do, how to meaningful participate in this struggle? I mean, I think Max Isle said something really important the other day when he said, you know, don't look at it as just solidarity, right? The struggle for Palestinian liberation is a power, is a key part of the world that we want to bring about. about. It, we need to see it as our struggle as well. And so um, obviously this is heightened by the fact that our governments are, you know, are, are, are direct key cogs. They are, they're supporting this. They are the, the dog that wags the tail. Right. And so, um, yeah, just some of your thoughts on how people need to be positioning ourselves and thinking in the in the West as well. Yeah, I'm thinking. Um, I don't like uh, these protests that are happening. I think the demand should be about like getting to the root cause of things, as we've been saying. You know, ending the blockade, not just a ceasefire that's just going to be a break, and then Israel will get around to killing every like other people in Gaza later. Uh, you know, it's, um, I think, and I know as difficult as this can be in a lot of circumstances, but I would say don't contribute to to demonizing Palestinian resistance. Don't give in to these, because especially if you're in the U.S., you know, the U.S. has already deemed it as terrorists. It's already done all these things. Um, you don't need to join those voices. You, uh, it's like kind of allowing Palestinians that dignity, I would say, and uh, not kind of caving into that rhetoric of all oh, this, you know, because we're all deemed terrorists at the end of the day. Like all Palestinians are deemed to be these like violent, irrational threats and to not contribute to that, to kind of stand against that, to really be, to try to keep humanizing Palestinians, talk about us as as people with the, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as as people with our goals and our you know dreams and our political aspirations and our desire to not have our children live through what we have lived through up to this point so you know ending the uh, calls to end the, the occupation itself calls to end the the blockade um obviously you know humanitarian aid is not the the root solution but of course if you can uh, contribute to like medical aid for palestinians those map uh, groups like the Palestine Children Relief Fund, things like this. Yeah, they're some of the few people that can actually get into Gaza right now. Yeah, because that's been really difficult. I, we see, you know, these videos of uh, Egyptian uh, truck drivers being really frustrated. Like this aid has been sitting here at the borders uh, for so long. We need to let it in. Um, you know, calling for that aid to be let in unconditionally. Really standing against this kind of like foul rhetoric that we've been seeing from the likes of uh, Sarah Silverman acting like it's acceptable to deny millions of people water and electricity and then she's also wrong by the way she's also an occupying power like, they, free, literally it's international law they have to provide water and power for, to them, for literally. free like how you want to charge it like they no they do charge it's not for free I know we pay for it anyway I'm, but my point Sorry. is that it's, they pay anyways it's it's the fact that i don't know we we kind of recently uh this was part of our myth that we wrote about this idea, this kind of ludicrous idea that Gaza is not really occupied just because the form of the occupation has changed since the settlements left Gaza in 2005. Uh, kind of recently on our Instagram, we put the little graphics talking about like how much they control life in, in Gaza. So kind of like centering that, if you can get yourself educated on, on what life in Gaza has been like, I feel like that kind of is the fuel for being passionate enough to go out into the streets in a long term or to to support uh, Palestine in a long term way um, and kind of small things I like reading being educated Institute for Palestine Studies has made some articles free uh, about Gaza. there's one that I, I really enjoyed it was about the well, not enjoy, but found useful, I guess. It's uh, the, it's called the 12 years of Gaza. it ends in 2014. So it's a bit outdated now, but still it kind of talks about why the occupation in Gaza has looked the way it has over the years and how, you know, the aggressions kind of predate 2023, obviously, by a lot. Um, even like the, is it the Institute for Film Studies? God, I, I'll i maybe just send you the link to this later, but it's uh, some films on Palestine have been made free, uh, you know, letting uh, Palestinian uh, filmmakers and artists uh, get their voices out. Um, if you're, yes, if you're an artist... 
Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely will. I I retweeted it recently, but as you can see, probably throughout this entire two hours, I'm terrible at remembering names and things like this. That's but right. um, you know, if you're if you're an artist, even um, in in the U.S. or in the U.K. or any of these places, even just mentioning the name of uh, Hiba, she's a Palestinian, you know, acrylic artist who um, was recently killed by an Israeli airstrike. Her and her only child um just in letting her her voice live on like not letting us uh, be forgotten yeah i think generally just make sound like make some noise like direct action like be in the against, uk like, they're yeah, literally yeah, like in the, they're literally up. painting like well I, I cannot say this officially but they are throwing paint on bbc and other organizations complicit in palestine or the, the weapons manufacturing Elbit, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, that actually, but, I just saw the uh, United States, uh, somebody actually sent me this while we were talking that uh, there's now a, a part of the shut Elbit down campaign that mm -hmm. Palestine action that is, has uh, come to life in the United States as well. And so folks should check right. that out. That's another direct action um, approach for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think it's important that that people don't get bogged down discussing this current escalation. I think it's important to keep everything in its historical context. This is not some unique event that's happening. This is not unprovoked as the world has been calling for a while now. This is all part of the same story. And if you want to actually have a solution, you have to go back to the beginning of the story. We can't keep looking at symptoms because that's what's more convenient for some people at the expense of the others. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even just, even um, small things like the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights. We're supposed to have a conference um, towards the end of October. I want to say in Chicago, it was and that canceled. yeah, it was canceled mm -hmm. because of all these threats. Like um, fighting back against uh, these threats to Palestinian events. Like who, by the way, even like you know, events that are just literary events or conferences and all these things. They're all like being attacked to the world ride right now. Um, Appeasement doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They're gonna take that and chew you out. They they will and I'm talking about like Israel apologists, they will take the little bit of, you know, both sidism, the little bit of, and then they will just completely not give anything back. Like appeasement does not work. There are people who are actively invested in the oppression of Palestinians and you can't meet them halfway there. A lot of people, like you can't just meet them halfway. And this should like even, I mean, I know that we we are very critical of electoralism for kind of reasons that maybe feel obvious, but yeah, but this should actually be an issue that breaks Biden. This should not. You should not support someone yeah. who uh, is so willing to kill all these Palestinians to to fu to fund through your tax dollars um, our oppression. Um, it's it's kind of like standing. That I feel like so much of it is so it's about like shifting the overtime window back. It used to be just like barely Palestinians were supposed to be talking about a two state. Like no, we need to we need to shift this as much as possible so that we could start like tackling these you know material struggles yeah, yeah. I, like i know like especially in the united states and europe it's there's like a mccarthyism a new mccarthyism coming around around palestine especially lately uh, i know that's a little bit scary and terrifying but uh, imagine how terrifying it is to be in gaza right now and how hard they fought how much they've given and uh i mean that's yeah i think that's important yeah. because uh, you know i mean look like you know you all facing potential you know like you're there and you're having this conversation right i'm here i'm having this conversation all of that you know could be demonized you know people could come after our, our youtubes our patron patreons whatever like and you know yes these things will impact us materially people can lose their jobs you know and i think that um and you know i said this on one of our streams but i i really do believe that um, we may look back at this time and uh, either be very proud of what we did or be very ashamed of what we did not do. And I think Absolutely. that, um, you know, we, we all have to, to think through that kind of uh, moral clarity and lens and understand that um, there's a very clear right side to be on in this struggle. And it is not going to be something that... Um, our, our states or our jobs are necessarily, you know, they're going to be antagonistic to um, taking the right position here. And that means that we have to organize better. It means we have to support each other as much as we can. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we should all succumb to, to fear either. Um, and I, I think it's really important that people understand that, um, you know, we may, we may have to sacrifice some things, but uh, you know, that, 
our sacrifices are nothing. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, I mean, I, I don't need to, we've, we've talked before with you all about the sort of exceptionalizing of women and children, but it, it's really also very stark, you know, the, the amount of violence that is being enacted in Gaza right now uh, among people that, um, you know, support Palestinian liberation. I think it, you know, this idea of like separating them out and saying like, oh, they're not the resistance or whatever, like, you know, that 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 is problematic. It's also very problematic to say that they aren't civilians, to say that they that they don't have, um, you know, rights under international law because of uh, what the resistance that the resistance is fighting in a liberation struggle. Um, and so these are complicated realities, but we have to understand that the, the consequences on real human beings there are, you know, incredibly greater than what we do face here in the West. Um, I think I just want to say this. So um, quickly shout out to the other Jared. This is a reference to Jared Ball on Black Power Media. Uh, they are another outlet that has been having a lot of really important and, you know, solidaristic conversations right now around the Palestinian liberation struggle as well. And so shout out to the work that they do and always shout out to the other Jared. Um, I think that we will. Uh, yeah. And then <laughs> hashtag break Biden. I, I'm, I'm all for this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be the first person. I'll be the conductor on this train. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, much appreciated, everybody, and especially to you, Rowan and Fati. Um, I appreciate all the amazing work you do and the time that you have spent this. And, uh, you know, our, our, our best wishes uh, for you and for the struggle of Palestinian liberation. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jared. And we're really grateful to spaces uh, like this that we've opened up that allow us to have uh, these kind of like much needed conversations. Yeah, this is our second time now on the show. And hopefully the next one will be free. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll we'll do another live stream after the. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. After we'll, liberation. We'll, some sometime, I think we have to have you on when it is not uh, in the middle of a of a current war. You know, phase of ethnic cleansing or or you know warfare that's going on. You know, so yeah, absolutely. All right, appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank Jeff. you. Thank you for everything. Thank you.